Exercise is a form of physical, mechanical stress that we apply in our bodies. This type of physical stress can achieve different goals, from weight loss, bodybuilding, performance, and longevity. All of this depends on the type of mechanism that we try to target. And here, longevity is our primary goal. And the major longevity mechanism that exercise activates is autophagy. Exercise activates autophagy. But knowing that doesn't tell us the secret on how to use exercise for longevity. For that, we need to ask the question, how does exercise exactly activate autophagy? Because if we know that, then we can target this autophagy mechanism with our exercise routine. There are two ways by which exercise activates autophagy. The first one is called hypoxia. This term is very important today, so please try to remember that and understand what it means. Hypoxia comes from hypo, which means low, less, and oxygen, combination of low oxygen. And hypoxia really means low oxygen levels inside the cell. In hypoxia, this oxygen deficiency is probably the most potent way to stimulate autophagy. Nothing seems to come close. Now, why does hypoxia, low levels of oxygen, stimulate autophagy? For that, we need to understand what does low oxygen levels inside the cell mean to the DNA, mean to the cell. Let me quote from this study from 2010. It's called Proline Metabolism and Microenvironmental Stress. I'm quoting. Nutrients are more severely depleted than oxygen because oxygen can diffuse through tissue with greater efficiency than nutrients. Thus, it can be assumed that all the circulating nutrients, for example, glucose, glutamine, fatty acids, and circulating amino acids would be at low supply. So what does it mean? It means that hypoxia, low levels of oxygen within the cell, not only tells the cell that there is not enough oxygen to produce energy, but it also tells the cell that all other nutrients are low. In essence, the cells are using low levels of oxygen to sense the entire environment and sense nutrient deprivation. This is why hypoxia is such a potent inducer for autophagy. A protein recycling and survival mechanism under a nutrient deprivation environment. How can we create this oxygen deficiency in order to activate autophagy with our exercise? Simple, but exercising intensely. When you perform an intense exercise, oxygen levels within the cell plummet. When you think about sprinting and struggling to breathe, it means that your lung are struggling to provide enough oxygen. This request or demand for oxygen from the lungs is actually coming from the cells directly. And when your heartbeat goes up, this too suggests hypoxia. As the heart struggles to provide enough blood and oxygen to the cell, this is hypoxia. In addition, of course, to the request of the cells to remove CO2 from the blood as well. In contrast, when you do a leisurely walk and have a low heart rate and breathe easily, this suggests no hypoxia at all. So it means that by observing your breathing and heart rate during your exercise, you can estimate hypoxia within the targeted cells. And the more intense the exercise is, the lower oxygen levels we will reach. And this means more activation of autophagy. This is great for longevity. So hypoxia is one way in which exercise activates autophagy. The second way that exercise does so is by creating cellular damage, or muscle damage, if you will. Let's cover that right now. Let's hear from Dr. Eileen White about how exercise stimulate autophagy, and she also touches hypoxia as well, which is good for us. Let's hear it now. It's from an interview with Dr. Peter Rattia. In terms of exercise, that's very well studied that exercise induces autophagy very potently. And you actually need autophagy to, because exercise damages the muscle. Mm -hmm. And autophagy is one of the processes that helps mitigate the damage that occurs during exercise. What about hypoxia? Oh, potently. Hypoxia potently induces autophagy. So muscle damage from exercise stimulates autophagy. What type of exercise creates this muscle damage? High intensity training, again. This is another hint that the intensity of our exercise can help us to increase our longevity. And indeed, 
A study of nearly half a million people suggests that intense exercise leads to the greatest longevity benefits and reduced mortality. It is called minimum amount of physical activity for reduced mortality and extending life expectancy, a prospective cohort study. Let's hear now Dr. James O'Keefe, our cardiologist, speaks about this study. Okay, and this is a study of over 400,000 Chinese that was just published within the last year. We published an editorial along with this afterwards, but they found that vigorous exercise, this is all-cause mortality reduction, the more reduction, the better, and this is minutes of daily exercise, so 10, 20, 30 minutes of daily exercise up, at 40 it starts plateauing, at 45 or 50, you get a point for further, uh, further uh, it plateaus, so further efforts and time do not convey, appear to convey further improvements in life expectancy. Down here, is moderate exercise, light to moderate exercise, walking, housework, day to day, moving around. Just get off your seat, move around. More is better there. It doesn't, it's not quite as beneficial as vig vigorous exercise, but more is better. Dr. Rhonda Patrick speaks also about the brain benefits of intense exercise. This is from an interview with Dr. Peter Atia. I specifically sort of designed my workout routine based off of what I think are gonna give me the biggest brain benefits. And what I've sort of come to the conclusion of is that intensity does make a difference with respect to the neurobiological effects. Exercise intensity. What is intensity? In terms of exercise, intensity is the actual stress that you expose your muscles, your heart and lungs to. And this is truly what creates hypoxia and muscle damage. Exercise intensity is controlled by three parameters, speed, resistance, and time under stress. For example, if you run, you're training your leg muscles, your heart and lungs. If you increase your speed, you increase your intensity on those organs. However, if you run at the same pace, for more time than usual, to the point that your body struggles, basically you increase your intensity by increasing time under stress without changing your speed. And thirdly, if you run and now you carry a heavy bag in your pack, this increases the resistance against the power of gravity. So this increasing your intensity without actually increasing speed or time under stress. So you can apply these three principles to any exercise that you're doing right now to increase the intensity. So we want intense exercise to create hypoxia, but that's not everything. Dr. David Sinclair suggested that alternating oxygen levels is the best longevity strategy. Let's hear him speaking about that. Hypoxia, the low oxygen when you go for a run, what it's doing is turning on this HIF1-alpha protein that I talked about earlier, uh, and that uh, helps promote health in the body. Hyperbaric chamber treatment does the very similar thing. You get a production of these free radicals and that stimulates also a mitohormesis response that gives you very similar benefits to low oxygen. Um, there's one theory that I have is that when you come down from the high levels of oxygen, it stimulates, simulates hypoxia, like you're running as you come down from high levels to low levels. It's yeah. the differential and that fits with the new findings, which is going up once and coming down once is not as good as going up and down and up and down within a treatment. So what's the meaning of what Dr. David Sinclair said to our exercise routine? It means that if what he said is true, then intense exercise in intervals, meaning heat, high intensity interval training, is actually better for longevity than just intense exercise if you want to induce autophagy. Now, I searched for a study that would compare intense exercise versus interval intense training, but I could not find one. The one thing that we are sure about is that intense exercise activates autophagy, which increases longevity. How can you apply that type of training? You can do sprinting in short bouts. You can do high intensity training in a bicycle and you can use the elliptical machine. In those cases, you're going to cycle oxygen up and down during the exercise and you apply high intensity training, which activates the longevity pathways.
When I measured my blood sugar, two of the biggest surprises that I had had to do with stress and bad sleep. I noticed that when I was stressed or when I sleep poorly that day, my blood sugar spiked 20 to 25% without eating any sugar. It's a sugar that my body used to make by converting protein into sugar. Now, why is that important, you may ask? Because these increases in blood sugar are really bad for your longevity. You want to keep your blood sugar as low as possible within the limits of healthy, normal range without becoming hypoglycemic. The studies are documenting this phenomena very well. Keep your blood sugar low and live longer. I don't think there is any debate at this point. So after measuring my blood sugar, I knew that poor sleep wasn't good for my longevity. And my only way to counteract this phenomena is first, try to sleep better, which is not really possible, especially when life happens. And two, what I tried to do in, in the days that I did sleep poorly was try to take a nap. But all in all, I was too merciful on my own body because I said, you, you know what, I didn't sleep well, I won't push my body too hard that day. I was actually afraid of creating too much stress, too much cortisol. I was afraid that poor sleep will increase cortisol and then intense exercise will increase cortisol as well. But recently, I watched an interview with Dr. Rhonda Patrick and it was obvious to me that I'm missing something. The biggest and most compelling and most important data point that I sort of learned from wearing my continuous glucose monitor which was the effect that my sleep interruption yeah. had on both my fasting blood glucose. I could get like pre, like what can be considered like pre-diabetic. Like I was like blown away. I was like, what is, this is insane. And the effect lasted at about, I would say like about 48 hours or so. When I did work out and I was, at the time I was doing a lot of high intensity interval training. I was, it was like an hour long sp spin class I used to go to, you know, where they do all this interval training. Um, that it almost completely blunted that effect where I, even though I was dog tired, last thing <laughs> I want to do was go to my damn spin class. I was just like, this is like, I can't, it's going to be bad for me if I go. That's how I felt <laughs> like it's going to be bad for me. But it was completely the opposite where crazy glucose, you know, dysregulation and it was almost completely blunted and it was so profound. And really that was the thing that for me was like, I have to work out no matter what. Rhonda said, in the days that we sleep poorly, this is the best time to not give up on exercise and actually do the intense exercise that day. She said that she measured CGM, which is Continuous Glucose Monitor, and she found that exercise was the only antidote that actually managed to reverse completely the impact of bad sleep on blood sugar. So this is fascinating. I didn't know that exercise can do that, to be honest. So my resistance of applying physical stress on my body in days that I was stressed, quote unquote, because of bad sleep was a mistake. And by the way, on a personal note, everyone has their biggest weakness when it comes to routines for health. Some people have difficulties with taking supplements. Some others have problem with diet others with exercise. I have clients who don't like to exercise and have to devise programs with zero exercise for them. My biggest weakness has to do with my sleep. So for me, sleep, which sounds like the easiest thing of all of the, those tools, actually is the most difficult thing for me. Especially it was difficult in the last seven months since my wife had a stroke. So for me, I'm stopping with the mercy on my body. When I sleep poorly, I'm going to exercise harder. Let's see if I could follow through with the action because talk is cheap. If you want to learn more about habits for longevity, I recommend watching the complete guide for exercise for longevity, the 11 habits that you can do today. I'm going to put a link in the description and also at the end of this video.